good morning. Welcome to Mountain View Church. Good to see all of you here today. We have a real treat for us on this rainy day and first day of daylight savings time. Um, I didn't know that we we're going to, ha- uh, when I scheduled this, I didn't know that this was the first day of daylight savings time. So we're that you're all here and we're looking forward to a great potluck together. Great uh, time also. There's a great time fellowship, I should say, but also following that uh, luncheon, there'll be a short meeting about two potential uh, short-term mission trips, one to Germany this summer and then one to going back to Romania. Of course, we have a sister church there, and we haven't sent some people there in a while. So if you've never been to those places, that's a great, those two places would be a great place for you to invest your summer. So think about that. Of a special treat, uh, uh, Michael Moore is going to come. He's from uh, Chosen People. Michael and I have a connection on a couple of accounts. And Michael, number one, grew up in Riverside, California. That's where I, where my first pastor was. And then secondly, uh, the president of uh, Chosen People is a guy by the name of uh, Mitch Glazer, Dr. Mitch Glazer now. Mitch and I were close friends in seminary at Talbot Seminary many moons ago. And uh, so I told him, be sure to tell him I said hello. We're, why do we, as people have asked, why do we, why do we s- schedule this? Uh, number one, we want to know, we're, we're committed to the Bible. We want to understand the Bible. And this is, is going to give you an insight into the Bible and the Old Testament uh, that perhaps some of you have never seen before. And if you've seen it before, it's great to see it again. But secondly, uh, we are committed to Israel. There's a growing theology today in our nation that's called preterist theology, which is another word for replacement theology, where the, many believe that the church has replaced Israel, and that Israel no longer has a, a part in God's plan. We believe that the church and Israel are separate, two plans that are moving together down through the time of, of history, and that we believe that God has a plan for Israel uh, even in the tribulation and in the millennium, millennium. so we 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 welcome God's chosen people here, Michael. We're glad that you're here, and we feel very special that you've come to join us today. So let me leave some prayer, and then after that, Michael will come up. So, Father, we're we're so thankful for this opportunity to have one of your chosen ones to be with us today to share, and uh, Lord, help us to have a heart to hear what you have to say. And Father, we're so excited about things we're going to learn today. Uh, perhaps we've never heard before and for some things will be a reminder to us but again lord be with michael may he just have real freedom of expression here may the spirit of god just speak through him and may you be glorified in our our hour together in christ's name we pray amen would you help me welcome michael moore from chosen people mountain view church good morning Shalom, it is really nice to be with you. I'm gonna get behind here in the table here in a moment uh, to get set up, but I just wanna say thank you so much, first off, for having me. So, Dr. Pastor Byron, thank you. Jim, thank you for reading Isaiah 53. We will talk about Isaiah 53 later on, so that was perfect to be reading. Now I see you back there. Also, hello online. I have no idea where the cameras are, but uh, hello. There they are. Uh, and also, bravo for waking up early. You're the, you're, the, you're the few, you're the committed. So let me get back here, and we will have a great time together. Also, music team, I'm going to move this, all right? So I hope I'm not ruining anyone's plans. Okay. Well, I'm coming from New York, so first off, I want to say thank you for getting me out of New York. It's nice to be out. Yeah, that's right, that's right. (laughs) I'm not originally a New York native, so I don't mind, you know. I do really appreciate New York. It's actually really awesome, uh, but I also enjoy. When I get out of New York, I'm like, wow, this is the way the regular world is living. I'm like, people have cars, and you drive, and you can park, and you could go through Chick-fil-A drive throughs and it's just like, wow, it's so nice. Um, So... I am so grateful and excited to be able to share this time with you because it's something extremely exciting and something extremely special. I don't know about you, 
but I myself am not Jewish. And if you're not Jewish, you most likely would not have grown up celebrating these traditions. But when we go through these traditions, you're going to find, oh my goodness, how has this been in the Jewish tradition for so long? And how has, have all these symbols pointed to the Lord and I never knew about them? So I have, I guess, quick show of hands. Who has ever participated in a Passover Seder before? Okay, great. Some of you have. Wonderful. If not, here's my two hopes for you today. My first hope is that you personally are just going to be blessed and encouraged. And I know that you will because you're going to see things about the Lord Jesus in this dinner that you may have never heard before. So I pray on a devotional, educational level, you are just encouraged and you love Jesus more as a result of it. And also, my second hope for today is exactly what Pastor Byron talked about. It sounds like you already have a heart for Israel and Jewish people, and that is wonderful, but not everybody does. And so if that heart is already there, thank the Lord. I just pray that your heart for Jewish people in Israel will also go deeper. Because when you see the things that we're going to go through tonight, or today, this morning, sometimes some people will come up to me and ask me, how can the Jewish people not see it? And there's kind of like a, a little bit of a negative tone, like how can they not see it? But I don't know about you, but I once was blind, and thank God now I see. All of us need the Lord's help. All of us need the Lord's help to sometimes connect the dots. And thankfully, we can sort of look back with hindsight and say, thank you, Lord, at all these things that clearly pointed to you. But my hope is that while you're encouraged and blessed, that your heart for Jewish people will go deeper and that when you see these things, if that rises up in you, how can Jewish people not see these things that your heart would then turn to prayer and say, Lord, lovingly, could you help them see? So those are my two big hopes for to us today. Um, before we really dive in though, just so I'm not a stranger to you, I'm gonna go through a very quick version of a testimony and I'm gonna have to like point back and forth. So Jerry, thank you. Here we go. I am a missionary to Jewish people, but I'm not Jewish. So a lot of times people ask me, why on earth did you go down this road and how did this happen? Well, in a very fast version, I grew up in Riverside, which I was so excited when I read on your bio that you pastored in Riverside. I was like, oh, Riverside, I miss it. Um, I grew up in Southern California in what I would consider a very normal Christian home. I uh, didn't really know much about Jewish people, but I loved God, read the Bible, and my dad sent me to a Christian school, and I'm so thankful because it was there at a young age that God saved me. So God, I love you. I want to live for you. But what does that mean? Well, fast forward in time. It, I joined the Salvation Army. I don't know if any of you know, but they are more than bell ringers and thrift stores. They are actually a church, and they do a lot of good around the world. I joined them. I ministered with them. Uh, after a while, I eventually worked for a Bible software company, and that was a great job. But eventually, a door opened up to go to Israel. And I thought, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to go. I'm going to study history. I'm going to study archaeology. I'm going to study Jewish background stuff. And then I'm going to come home, and I'm just going to sort of keep living life like normal. Well, when I was in Israel, one year of studying the Bible turned into living there for almost three years because a number of things started to happen, and my personal heart started to break. One of the first things that happened is I was at the actual scene, if we could go, of a terrorist attack. That was bad. But what actually hurt more is when I saw the way that the news talked about it the next day in the States. Now, I'm not saying all news things, but I, I, don't, I won't would name which one, but there was one where it was just like, if you would have read the headlines, you would have thought Israel and Jewish people were the worst people and country in the world. And they didn't like bother to really get into the facts of what happened. And my heart broke. And then I saw, oh my gosh, this was happening again and again and again and again. And I felt like, Lord, Israel and your Jewish people can't seem to catch a break. And my heart was saddened for that. But what also saddened it more was, if you go to the next one, talking with a, a Jewish man at the Western Wall. We were just talking. It was a nice conversation. Um, and he really revealed something that is in an average Jewish person's heart. And that's this. You can be anything in Jewish because you're born Jewish. You have blood running through your veins. You are a part of the people of Israel. You are Jewish through and through. You could be Jewish and Buddhist. You could be Jewish and atheist. You don't even need to believe that the God of the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is real. You don't even need to believe that the stories in here are real, but you're still Jewish. Anything in Jewish. But can you guess what the one thing is 
that makes you not Jewish anymore? Believing in Jesus. In the average Jewish heart and mind, the moment you believe in that man, you have committed one of the worst things you can against your own people. Now, we don't have time for all the history, but in a very short version, if we could go to the next slide, um, there has been a lot of painful history over 2,000 years where people who claim to follow Jesus have done really painful things to Jewish people. And I mean, I'm talking really bad. If, if you want to be depressed, we could talk about a lot of it, but we don't want to be depressed here, okay? So all I could say is this quote is a very accurate way of representing it. This comes from my boss, Mitch Glazer, who's a Jewish believer, and he says this about Jewish people coming to faith. He's a Jewish believer. We come slowly. It's aggravating, I know. It's because we're not coming from zero, but minus 10, because of the painful past that occurred between Christians and Jews. It's not that we're not Christian, it's that we don't want to be Christians. In fact, we often identify ourselves as we're not Christian. So before a Jewish person comes to faith, there's there's an emotional barrier because, this might shock you a little bit, this is the average on an emotional level, I'm not talking logically or theologically, this is the feeling that comes up. This is a real photo. It's during Nazi Germany. It's in Germany. And in German, it says, Jews not welcome here. And what's right next to it? Jesus on the cross. So it's sort of persecutors, Jesus, Christians, all the same, one and one. And we know that that's not true. That's a very unfortunate thing, but a lot of painful things have been done in the past to where, again, the average Jewish person has a hard time even thinking about Jesus. So I had no idea about that. So my heart was personally stirred, and if we could go to the next slide. Uh, I, cho- I joined Chosen People Ministries. I'm so grateful to work for them. If we could go to the next slide. I, I work with Dr. Mitch Glazer. We're right down the hall from each other, and I am a missionary. I am a faith-based missionary working on the wide end of the funnel. Meaning, one of the best gifts an average Jewish person can receive is a Christian just like you who walks into them, runs into them one day, and they find out, oh my gosh, you're Jewish. I really love you. Did you know Jesus wants me to love you? That is such a surprise. The average Jewish person does not know that. And so I speak at a lot of churches and I get to meet a lot of Christians in order to help uh, Christians, fellow believers, love Jewish people deeply because that has long-term effects down the road. And I also, I thank God, I get to take Christians and churches to Israel to meet our missionaries there, to get involved with the missionary work there. So I'm so grateful for what I do. Um, And that is a very quick background. Uh, And now we will actually start to enjoy some of the Passover, all right? Let's pray one more time, though, and then we'll dive in. Father, thank you. And Lord, just thank you for who you are. Thank you for being so kind, so loving, so faithful. Father, you are kind, loving, and faithful to the Jewish people. And Father, you're kind, loving, and faithful to the world, to us, the nations. And we thank you. Lord, this morning, as we go through this Passover Seder, could you open our eyes? Can you open our hearts? Can we see you more clearly and just see how more beautiful you are than we even realize? And Father, could you help our hearts uh, continue to be soft and break for our fellow Jewish brothers and sisters and to love them with gentleness and compassion? We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so... Jesus was Jewish, and we know that he celebrated Passover, and you ask, how do we know he celebrated Passover? Great, you already know the answer, because thank God Leonardo da Vinci was there, and he painted the scene, all right? So, great painting. If you have it in your house, keep it up. However, not accurate, biblically speaking. And so what we want to do today is we want to go through a traditional Jewish family Passover meal, and we're going to ask, if we could go to the next slide, what was Jesus, oh, sorry, sorry, giving it scriptural reference. In Luke chapter 22, it's very clear. Jesus says, go find the upper room. That's where they eat and prepare the Passover for us. So Jesus is eating during the Last Supper, the Passover meal with his disciples. The Last Supper wasn't just a general meal. It was a Passover meal according to Luke chapter 22. So, but what we want to do is we want to say, okay, Jesus, what were you doing that night? 
And what would you have been using within the existing traditions to say, hey, this is about me. So that's what we're going to do. If we could go to the next slide. So at the beginning of every Passover, there is a recitation of what the Passover is all about. So we're going to do this Sunday school style, okay? So don't be afraid to shout out loud. If you know the answer, great. If you don't, it's okay, but I'm sure you will. So there was a man with a colorful coat and his name was Joseph. And we, we could just go to the former slide. We don't need that one yet. Thank you though, Jerry. He was sold into in the land of by his Great, and he rose in power, but then eventually uh, there came a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph and all of Israel was now down in the land of Egypt. And so they were enslaved and then God raises up a baby boy named Moses and his mother puts him in a, floats him down the Nile River. Who finds him? Pharaoh's daughter, good. Uh, then all, we don't know when and how, but somehow eventually Moses realizes I'm a Hebrew. I'm an Israelite. And so Moses then sees an Egyptian taskmaster doing what to a Hebrew slave? And when he sees that, he does what to the taskmaster? Kills him. So then he flees, he goes to Egypt, and he sees a miraculous thing called a bird. Bush, great. And the Lord speaks to him from it and more or less says to, what? to Moses, you're going to go and do what? Save my people. You're going to free my people. And Moses says, I don't talk so good. I'm not really your man. And the Lord is like, don't worry. I'm going to send you Aaron. He's a better speaker than you. I understand, okay? So they both go back to Egypt and Moses says what to Pharaoh? Great. Moses sings what to Pharaoh? Let my people go. Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Uh -uh. Okay, no one, no one sings those songs? All right. So Pharaoh more or less is like, no way. I don't even know who your God is. So God sends 10 plagues great the 10th plague was the most severe of all and it was the killing of the firstborn the death of the firstborn in order to not have that happen to you in your household what did you have to do to the doorposts of your homes blood on it of what animal a lamb in which case when the destroyer the angel came and saw that he would do what he would pass over. Great. And this is where we get it. So then Israel goes. That's the last plague. Pharaoh says, get out. And then they leave and they go from, um, they go from Egypt and they come to a body of water called the Red Sea. And God, what? Parts it. They cross on. Great. They get to a mountain called Mount Sinai and they receive 10 or another 600 plus according to Jewish tradition. Uh, and then after that, it's just a short 39-year jaunt. And there you go. You're in the promised land. So that is the Passover story, okay? Obviously, the Passover is focused on the lamb, the last plague part, but that is the Exodus story, and a Jewish family will recite this to remember. So what is the purpose of having this dinner every single year? It is to remember that once we were slaves, that it, the people, the Jewish people remember once we physically, literally in history were slaves in Egypt. But God with his righteous right arm saved us and took us from slavery to freedom. Now, it also, if you look at the grand narrative, in that event, woven into the very fabric of that event was the picture of how the whole world would also be saved. And that salvation would come by the death of of a lamb on behalf of every single person, the Jewish people and the world. So if we could go to the next slide. Next slide as well. Great. So here is, oh, let me give you also a little uh, piece of information. Normally a Passover dinner easily lasts four hours if you do a traditional Passover dinner. We have, oh, about 30-ish more minutes. So <laughs> we're gonna bam, 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 okay? So we will not really be able to go through absolutely everything, but I'm gonna try to cover some of the main things, okay? Before Passover begins, about a week before, the mothers of the house clean the house and they're removing the house of what? Leaven. And why? 
because God instructed them. You are to remove your house of all leavened items. So if you love Twinkies, Hostess cakes, whatever, goodbye, all right? You're getting rid of that from your house. And then in a, in a traditional Jewish family, uh, the mother of the house will leave a few breadcrumbs the night before. The dad will come home, sort of like a macho G.I. Joe, go on a search for it. If the wife loves him, she will have left the crumbs in the same place she did last year and the year before and the year before. If not, he really has to go looking for it. Once he finds it, though, he scoops it up. He takes it outside of his house. He could also go to the synagogue, and there, together, people will collectively burn the last remaining bit of leaven, uh, symbolically saying, okay, our house is now pure. We are ready to celebrate the Passover. And again, they get this from the instruction of Exodus where God commands them to remove their house, uh, remove leaven from their homes. Did you know that Paul actually talks about this? Leaven is a symbol in the Bible sometimes for what? Sin. And what does Paul tell us? Paul says this. In 1 Corinthians, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So Paul is saying that Jesus was our Passover lamb. He was sacrificed for us and remove the leaven in, our, in your hearts. And he, he takes it and applies it spiritually. This is not that different than one of our favorite Psalms as well, where David says in Psalm 139, search me, O Lord, know me, see if there be any grievous way within me. And we also, even though this is an event in history and it's a tradition, we can apply that to our own lives. Lord, is there anything going on in me? Do you, is there any leaven that you need to help me purge? And if so, Lord, could you help me clean it and give it over to you? All right, after removal of leaven, then if we go to the next slide, Passover is ready to begin. So the mom of the house, may I invite you up? Starts the Passover. Most of the traditions, the dad does it or the rabbi does it. Jesus himself as the leader of the disciples would have been doing most of the things, but a woman of the house has to light the candles and feel free to light them whenever you're ready. The woman of the house has to light the candles. Passover cannot start until this happens. Now, uh, it could just be a tradition, but as believers in Jesus, thank you so much. Um, as believers in Jesus, we find this very fitting. And why? Well, it's because God promised that it would be through the seed of the woman that the light of the world would come into the world. So could be coincidental, who knows, but it is quite interesting and beautiful that it's the woman who has to light the candles. And that is her one primary role for the traditional aspect of this. And we do thank God that according to prophecy, Genesis 3.15, also Isaiah, behold, the virgin will give birth that it was through a woman that God brought the light of the world. Now that the, light, the candles have been lit, Passover, we have just separated from the day before to now the new day where we are celebrating Passover. It has begun. After lighting the candles, there are four different cups of wine that are drunk in the night or if you prefer grape juice, okay? So, there are four different cups and they are drunk in different parts of the evening. Um, the evening is separated into three sections, okay? There's before dinner and there's two cups of wine that are drunk before dinner. Then there's dinner, then there's after dinner, okay? Two more are drunk. And I'm gonna explain them in more detail, but a quick overview. The first cup is the cup of sanctification. The second cup is the cup of judgment. The third cup, very important. Remember this third cup. We will come back to it. Hint, 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 okay? The cup of redemption. And the fourth cup is the cup of praise. So the first cup, oh, actually, yeah, the first cup. Here we go. What am I doing? Overflowing. The first cup traditionally is poured to overflowing. Now why? Why? First off, this first cup is a cup of sanctification. And what that means is that this separates this night as different from all other nights. This is a holy, special night. And then not only is it set apart as special and holy, it started with an overflowing sense of joy. And why are we joyful? Why are the Jewish people joyful? Because we were slaves, but now we are free. What about us? We also can join in with the Jewish people and be grateful for their historical freedom but also be grateful that the Lord Jesus has set us free from the greater slavery of sin. What does the Bible tell us? John chapter one, 
to all who did receive him, that's Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so we celebrate and we thank the Lord. That thank you that once we were your enemies, but you have now made a way for us to become your children, adopted sons and daughters. Israel was once enslaved and are free. We once were slaves to our sin, but now we are free. So we appreciate the original historical context and also the deeper spiritual significance that we find within it. So that's always way too messy for me to drink. So I'll just symbolically grab this other one. But Jesus would have held up this cup with his disciples and prayed the traditional Jewish prayer, which is this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam bore peri hagathen, which is blessed are you, O Lord. You are our God and you are the king of the universe and you are the creator of the fruit of the vine. And all the disciples would have drunk the first cup, sanctifying all that was to come after in this evening. Okay, maybe go to the next slide. Washing of the hands. Now, in traditional Jewish custom, more historically, I feel like families now more or less are like very friendly and, you know, equality oriented. But historically, the person with the lowest status in the room would go around to every person around the table and they take a cup or a basin and they pour water over the hands three different times. And each time they do that, as they do that, they pray a traditional blessing. And what are they doing that for? Nobody look. Okay. Uh, what do they do that for? Oh, look at it. Never mind. I have something to dry them. They do that as a symbolic act of purity. Lord, we are coming to your table, to your altar, symbolically pure. Now, what do we see Jesus doing? We don't see the, the New Testament talking about the washing of hands. However, in his time, what did he do that evening? He, he got up he girded himself and he washed the disciples' feet. Was that his job? That wasn't his job. And actually what's really beautiful is if you think about it in its real big context in Philippians, that God, that Jesus is God of the universe and he's humbled himself. Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. God willingly got off of his throne in heaven and humbly came in the form of a man. But not only that, even before he got to the cross, he willingly took the role of the lowest servant and cleaned his disciples' feet. And then he says later on, I do this as an example for you and love others just as I have loved you. Now, this is pretty early in the meal. Who is still there at the table? Judas. Jesus even washed the feet of his own betrayer. Now that's the historical, what was happening. Let's just maybe miniature application for us right now. I don't know about any of you, but especially since you have a counseling background, which I think is wonderful, sometimes we can really struggle with shame. Lord, uh, you, no, just like Peter, Lord, no, you can't wash me, you know? But Jesus is saying, I want to wash you. I'm willing to wash you. Your dirty feet, they don't scare me. I'm coming to you humbly and I'm willing to wash you. And if you're willing, would you let the Lord wash you? Would you not be stuck in a place of shame? And instead, would we all be able to get just like Peter and say, Lord, okay, if you're gonna wash my feet, then wash all of me. Here I am. He's willing, he's loving, he's patient, he's kind, and he demonstrated it with the disciples and his heart is the same for us today and even the Jewish people today who still do not yet believe in them. him. He loves them and he wants them to know him personally. Amen. Okay. Next slide. Parsley. Wow, we've got a lot to cover. So here we go. You are not going to believe how much symbolism is loaded in this parsley, okay? What biblical plant does this parsley represent? Anybody remember? It's okay if you don't. Hyssop. And what was the hyssop used for? To apply the blood of the lamb to the door. So normally here's the tradition. Jewish people will take a piece of parsley in the Jewish home They'll dip it in some salt water. They'll eat it. Lord, thank you. Amen. Okay. Delicious. All right. They dip it in the salt water because the salt water represents the tears of slavery and also the Red Sea, which is salty water. So it represents tears of slavery, but also, Lord, we pass from slavery into freedom and we pass through the Red Sea. So the salt water represents both of those. Now I have parsley in my teeth. All right. But what about the parsley as well? Before we get to the whole tradition, 
This represents that extremely important plant, hyssop. Ooh, it's scratchy going down the throat too. Okay, so what happened? In Exodus, God commanded this. Speak to all the congregation of Israel and saying, on the 10th of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Your lamb shall be unblemished, a male and a year old. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Now imagine the process of that first um, Passover. There's excitement in the air. You've been a slave for 400 years, but you know that our freedom is supposedly coming close. There's this huge plague going to come, um, and we're supposed to do this um, slaying of the lamb and putting the door on the doorposts of our homes. Well, imagine you're a kid. Even though you live in an agrarian society, lambs are still outdoor animals, okay? So let's say your dad walks into the home, you know, and he's carrying a baby lamb on a little rope, you know, walking in. Dad, this is awesome. Little fluffy, he's going to sleep with me. But what is the dad doing? The dad's actually quite somber and serious. And why? Because he knows that he is supposed to inspect this lamb for four days, and this lamb cannot have any blemish. And at the end of four days, that lamb is going to die on behalf of every single person in that home, that family, and then the blood of that lamb will be applied to the door frames so that the angel of death will pass over. Also, there's a tradition. Now, this is not in the Bible. However, it's an interesting tradition that the lamb, after it was inspected, would then be taken out of the city gates to the uh, priest. The priest would inspect the lamb, and the lamb, after being inspected and found okay, would be declared, this lamb is worthy to be slain. Is this sounding familiar? The lamb is worthy to be slain. What do we read in the New Testament? Well, we already heard Paul says in 1 Corinthians that Christ is our Passover and he was sacrificed for us. What does John the baptizer say when he says, Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what does Jesus himself do? Well, he rides in on the ninth of Nisan on a donkey four days before Passover. He goes to the temple every single day, teaching in some sense, allowing himself to be inspected by the religious authorities to find that there's no blemish within him. He even declares through his actions that he's the king of Israel. And how does he do that? Well, he fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah. Behold, daughter of Zion, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. So he declares himself to be king through that humble action. He celebrates Passover with the disciples. He allows himself to be arrested. He's taken from the religious leaders to the Roman authorities. And then he's standing before the ultimate authority of the land in that time, Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate says, what? I find no guilt in this man. Or in other words, the lamb is worthy to be slain. Then from there, we know he goes to his crucifixion. So 1,500 years before Jesus, Israel was revealed their means of salvation. It was the blood of the lamb that would save them from their exodus out of Egypt, but also it pointed to a future salvation, a salvation for all of Israel today if they would but trust and put their hope in that lamb, but also for the nations, for the world. Because here's something really interesting. What part of the land of Egypt did the Israelites live in? Goshen. Now what happened? When it was when the Lord sent the plague of darkness and it was dark in the land of Egypt, what was it in Goshen? Light. There was no darkness. If you go through the, through the plagues, Israel was spared. But guess what? This one plague, no one was spared. Even Israel in the land of Goshen. The only way anyone could be saved was they had to apply the blood of the lamb. Hebrew, Jewish, Egyptian, everyone had to apply the blood of the lamb. And I know we know that because we're believers, so thank the Lord. But if you're not, if you're just, you know, if you attend church, but you've never applied the blood of the lamb to your hearts, would you apply it? Because Jesus wants to offer himself to you. And our, this is not very popular in our world today. It's not popular to make strong, exclusive statements, but the Bible is full of them. You know, for the ark and the flood, you were either in the ark or you weren't in the ark. Jesus himself made the ultimate truth claim. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And just like there was no way to be saved in the Old Testament in that time period from Exodus unless you took shelter under the blood of the lamb, the same is true for us today. It's the same that's true for us and also Israel and the Jewish people. But God invites all people to come to him. Uh, none of us need to be afraid. We could come to him and take shelter under his lamb. 
Okay, I am going to try to speed up some things. But are we tracking so far? Is everything okay? Is it making sense? So this hyssop has a lot of imagery in it. The plant that you was used to apply the blood over the doorpost. May we apply it to the doorposts of our own hearts as well. Now, I have multiple favorite of things in this evening, in this uh, in the Passover Seder, but this is one of them. This is a very special bag. Be prepared to be introduced to one of your favorite words now. Matzatosh, okay? I know, rolls right off the tongue. Matzatosh. This is a special bag because it's only used one time a year and it's during Passover. Now, there's a saying, two Jews, three opinions, all right? The Jewish world doesn't always agree, nor do we, but they don't always agree on everything. However, one thing that is agreed upon with this bag is this bag represents a unity. Okay, well, why is that so special? Well, because it's a unity. However, there are three parts in one. There's one, two, three. Three making up a unity. Now, what are some of the explanations? Well, maybe it's God, the priests, the people. Maybe it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Depending on which Jewish family you eat this dinner with, you'll get a different explanation. Now, during this part of the evening, Jewish families do this today, the middle of the three pieces of matzah is taken out. The middle of the three in one. Now, what is special about matzah? First off, it has no leaven, and leaven has again been known as a symbol of sin. So symbolically, this bread has no, no sin. Also, you may not be able to see it very well, but if you hold it up to a light, you'll be able to see the light through it because there are holes. When someone first described this to me, I thought, okay, come on, give me a break. You're really just trying to find Jesus in absolutely everything. However, I actually researched it, and it is required that when you make this matzah, you have to pierce it. It is required that you pierce the bread. Then you are also required to cook it at such a high heat that it starts to make these uh, bruises and stripes. So you have a middle piece of sinless bread, pierced, bruising, striped. Then it's broken. Then a piece of white linen cloth is used and it's wrapped up. Then it's hidden away and forgotten for a time period. You might also be able to say buried, okay? It's hidden away for a time and then we'll come back to that, okay? So we'll leave that there. We'll pause that there for the moment. Let the connections already be there for you in your mind. So we won't go through in detail, but one of the next cups that is drunk after that is the cup of judgment. And this remembers all the plagues that God brought upon Egypt and against their gods and how he showed his might over them. After the second cup of judgment, there's a song called Dayenu. It goes, Dayenu, Dayenu. It's complicated. I always struggle to sing it, and it's really long, but the meaning is beautiful. And they are saying Dayenu is a Hebrew word for it would have been enough. And it's this idea, Lord, if all you would have done is this, that would have been enough. If all you would have done is this and this, that would have been enough. And it goes on. Obviously, we know our human nature is, we struggle with that. However, it's an encouraging thing because um, David reminds us to have a similar heart. And he says this in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. I don't know about you, but my human nature is it's easy to forget. I could forget all that God has done for me. So sometimes we need help to remember intentionally. Thank you, Lord. You've done this and this and this. And that song symbolically helps the Jewish people remember. Thank you, Lord. You've done this for us. And we also express our gratitude to the Lord for it. So if we could go to the next slide. Bitter herbs. Uh, Pastor, you feel like eating some horseradish at the moment? Uh, as long as you're not allergic. <laughs> so if you want to, you're more than welcome to come eat some horseradish. Here's what happens. Uh, if you don't, it's okay. No one's going to be uh, angry at you. But a traditional Jewish family will dip horseradish. And if you go to an Orthodox Jewish family, they will make a whole matzah sandwich of raw grated horseradish. And the whole idea is to make yourself cry. We also like to call this Jewish sinus unclogger, okay? Because when you dip this, it hits the back of your sinuses and it really is spicy. Pastor, I'll take it for you, all right? I'll take the bullet. <laughs> Dear Lord, help me again, all right. Well, I normally don't do too much because otherwise that'll be the end of this presentation. So, 
But again, it represents the bitterness of slavery. Now, if we go to the next slide as well, charoset. If you don't like the person sitting next to you, go ahead and look at them and say charoset, okay? Charoset is a sweet mixture, apples, honey, walnuts, and it represents the mortar that was used in between the bricks. And there's a question. Why do we use something sweet to represent something so bad, so hard, so negative? Well, a traditional rabbinic explanation is that even in life's hardships, when you look to God and you hold on to his promises, there is sweetness. And the same is true for us today. What happened to Peter when he was walking on the water and he took his eyes off of Jesus? He sunk, right? We also need help to, Lord, life is complicated. It is hard, but we look to you. He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So, Lord, also symbolically, we remember you, we look to you, and even in hardships, we remember that there's sweetness when we hold on to you and your promises. Just to fulfill the full circle. Okay. Next slide. Um, what is this? I don't remember, just from the picture alone. Okay. Ah, yes. Hmm. I love this one, too. Now, on every family table is this. What is this? It's a bone of a lamb, and it's the arm bone, and it remembers what? That original Passover lamb that was sacrificed for them. Now, there's something very interesting. God instructed that not one bone of the lamb could be broken. And what do we know about Jesus when he's on the cross? When the Romans go around to make sure everybody's dead, they break the legs of the men next to him, but when they come to Jesus, they don't break his legs because they realize he's already dead. And the Gospels tell us that this was done to fulfill that prophecy that not one of his bones would be broken. So just like not one of the bones of the lamb was broken, not one of the bones of Jesus was broken in fulfillment of him being the Passover lamb. But there's also a very interesting connection here, a word play, and I'm gonna have to say this kind of fast, so I'm sorry, but the word for this in Hebrew is zeroah, and all it really means is arm, nothing special about it. However, if you look in the Old Testament, many times it is said that as another way of saying God saved Israel from Egypt, it says his mighty right arm, his mighty arm, the arm of the Lord saved Israel from Egypt. Isaiah says something very interesting. He says in Isaiah 53, which we read a little bit of earlier, so thank you, Jim. He says that the arm of the Lord is not too short that it cannot save Israel from their sins. He says in Isaiah 59 that their sins have separated them from the Lord, but that God's arm is not too short that it can't reach over and save them. Then he says in Isaiah 53, who has believed our message? Something about what he's gonna say isn't believable. Then he says this, and to whom has the arm of the Lord, the Zeroah, been revealed? The Zeroah of the Lord. Then he describes the Zeroah of the Lord like a lamb led to the slaughter. There's a word connection with the lamb bone that is on every single Jewish table for Passover. And this is what we know about the lamb of the Lord, the arm of the Lord. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. And yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. And so every year on the Jewish family table is this bone reminding them of the Passover lamb and we know that it also points to the ultimate greatest Passover lamb who died for our sins on our behalf. Amen? Okay. So if we could go to the, ah, yes. Now, after dinner, a very special piece of bread is brought back. The children are sent, go look for, this is called the afikomen, and it means that which comes later. So they go, they look for it, it was hidden, they don't know where it is, and then they bring it back, and when they bring it back, there's great celebration and rejoicing, usually because the dad of the house gives the child some money, all right? So, but there's joy, there's rejoicing, yay, the afikomen has come back. Then the father of the house unwraps the linen, takes out, the piece of bread, breaks it more, blesses it, and then passes it around to everyone at the table. Is this ringing a bell? 
this is where we get communion from. What, is, what, is, what do we see in the scripture? Let me, yeah, let me get to the text. There's so much I want to share with you. But what do we see in scripture? The Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, and that's this night, the Passover meal night, took bread, not just any bread, not just any ordinary dinner, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as, as often as you do eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If this bag, which represents three in one, a unity, is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if it is God, the priests, the people, why is the middle piece, which is sinless, pierced, striped, and bruised, taken out, broken, wrapped in a linen cloth, hidden away, brought back, and given to everyone? But if it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, then we know why. So we thank the Lord, and next time you take communion, you can remember, wow, all the symbols that existed. And Jesus took an existing tradition and said, that which you've been practicing all your life, guess what? It's about me, and here I am. Okay, so we are gonna come near to the end of this so I can honor our time. Here is the third cup. Remember when I said hint, hint, hint? This is a very special cup. This is the cup of redemption. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I, as a Christian, hear terms thrown around, and I'm like, oh yeah, I know what redemption is. But sometimes it's helpful to remember in a deeper way. In Hebrew, uh, you feel like volunteering just for a quick second? No? Okay. Here we go. I'll just show you then. In Hebrew, the Hebrew word for redemption, it's actually a slave market term. And what it means is that someone is held against their will. You're a slave. You have no freedom, no rights. You will not be able to do what you do. Your life is not your own. If you're an Israelite in Egypt, you do what we, the Egyptian tax masters, tell you what to do. Redemption is when someone comes and pays a price for you and says, because I'm paying a price for you, you are no longer held, bondage, held in bondage. You are no longer a slave but you're free. That cup represents the cup of redemption. The price that was paid on behalf of Israel was the innocent lamb that died for each and every single individual family. And Jesus holds up the cup after supper. That's what the New Testament tells us. He grabbed the cup after supper. That's that cup, the cup of redemption. And he says, this is my body which is shed for you, my blood which is shed for you. In other words, he's saying, I am paying your price. You no longer have to be a slave, but now you can be free. He took an existing image, an existing thing, and again, he said, that which you've been waiting for, that which you've been practicing all your life, the, the redemption you remembered back here, I am about to take care of the greatest need in humanity, which is ultimately sin. And I am going to the cross, I'm paying the price, and my blood is going to be this cup, the price paid for redemption to redeem you. So no, you no longer have to be chained, you no longer have to be a, a slave to sin, you are now free. Amen. So, we thank the Lord that first off, he freed Israel. He really freed a real people in real time, in real space from Egypt, but he also freed us from the greatest struggle that all of us as humans face. Israel faces it, Jewish people face it, we as Gentiles face it. We have all struggled with sin. Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me? And he says, you know, thanks be to the Lord, Jesus Christ will save me. Jesus saves us when we come to him, and he paid the ultimate price. So he would have hold, held up the third cup, blessed it, and drunk it with his disciples. That is the cup of redemption. Okay, we are near the end of time, so I will just give the last couple of things here. The final cup is the cup of praise. Now, why are the Jewish people praising the Lord? Well, again, we're free, and we thank the Lord. But also, they're praising the Lord specifically because in Exodus, God says, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. So they're thanking the Lord that you have made us your people. So that's one reason that they're praising the Lord. We also get to praise the Lord, and we thank him for that. Now, there's a tradition that 
Hallel Psalms, the praise Psalms are sung after Passover. Now those are very specific Psalms, Psalms 113 through 118. And if we were to read it, if you read through 113 through 118, you'll actually see that they recount the Exodus story, that when they got to the Red Sea, it parted. So they're remembering the Exodus story and they're praising the Lord for it. What does the New Testament tell us? Matthew 26, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The disciples and Jesus would have been singing after the Passover meal. And we can know what they were singing. Do you want to know what the last words were that were on the disciples' lips as they sang? Here's literally what the last words in Psalms 118 are. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And what do we know later on? That Jesus fulfills this, that he was the stone that the builders rejected. By and large, the Jewish religious authorities rejected him. But what does it say? Oh, the Jewish people are bad. Oh, they're all bad. No, it says this was the Lord's doing and it was actually marvelous. And then it was planned all along. God knew that this was gonna happen and it needed to happen. And we read earlier by, with Jim and Isaiah 53 that it pleased the Lord to crush his servant. Now that's kind of hard to think, but why? Because he knew that his servant would make an atonement for the many. So this was all a part of God's plan. And then what does it say? This is the day that the Lord has made. I always sing that, this is the day, this is, and I always thought it was generically, just any day you woke up, that was the day that the Lord has made. And that's true, but biblically, this is the day, the day that Jesus would go to the cross on behalf of all humanity that the Lord had made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And then what does it say? Uh, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What does Jesus say to Israel? He's coming to Israel as their king over Jeru- overlooking Jerusalem and he knows he will be rejected and he weeps for them. And he says, oh, how I've longed to gather you under my wings like a mother hand gathers her chicks. And then he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you know how you welcome someone in Israel today? If you really want to honor them, you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a way that you welcome someone of honor and significance into your home, uh, into any sort of situation. When the Israel, when the Jewish people say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, they will see him again. And so we want to pray that they would open their hearts and eyes to him in a very loving way, in a very gentle, kind way. That's what we want for them. So, that's the fourth cup of praise, and we're going to drink it in a moment. But before that, we need to talk about this cup right here. Who's this cup for? Anyone know? Uh, not the Holy Spirit, but good guess. Elijah. And why is that there? Because the prophet Malachi says that before the great and terrible day of the Lord's coming, he will send his prophet Elijah beforehand to prepare them for the coming of the Lord. And the, pro- the, the tradition says that he will come not just any generic day, but on the day of Passover. So the family sends the children to the door. They open up the door. They say, Elijah, Elijah, my teacher, Dr. Rich Freeman, he's a huge man. He's a Jewish believer. He's a huge man. And his uncle was always a jokester. So he would say, go to the basement. That's where Elijah's gonna be. And he says, you can't miss him. He's 3,000 years old. He's got a beard way down to here and he hasn't eaten in forever. And so every year he would go down and this is his story. He would say as a kid, please don't be there. Please don't be there. Please don't be there. Please don't be there. Sure enough, Elijah was never there. And when he would come up, he would tell his uncle and his uncle who was like a lighthearted jokester every year would actually get serious in this moment and say, maybe next year, maybe next year. The Jewish world needs the Messiah and we thank God that he's come. But because a lot of painful history, a lot of painful past, it's even hard to think about that maybe Jesus is the Messiah. We want to love them gently, kindly, and help them, help them realize Jesus is in fact the Messiah. We're sorry for the painful uh, barriers, but Jesus came, he fulfilled the prophecies, and he's waiting for you gently, kindly, and humbly. And we love you because we love Jesus, but because Jesus wants us to love you. So Elijah's not there. 
but they sing the final, they drink the final cup and then they go out singing the praise psalms and they drink this cup and they, before they drink it, they say, next year in Jerusalem. Do you know why they say that? Because they're hoping that the Messiah will return. Because when the Messiah returns, what happens? They all go back to Jerusalem. So symbolically, yeah, it's just nice to go back to Jerusalem, but they're actually looking forward to the return of the Messiah, even with the final cup of praise. So Lord, we thank you. We praise you that you did come. And we pray on behalf of the Jewish people, lovingly, gently, kindly, would you help their eyes be opened and could you use us in that process? And we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. Well, you squeezed about four, four hours of material into 40-ish minutes, so bravo, you, you made it through. If you're still logged in online, also good job. Um, here is my hope for you, and then we'll pray, and then uh, we'll enjoy a nice meal, and I don't know if there'll be worship or anything next, but um, I hope that your heart was uh, encouraged. I hope that you would see this and say, what? You mean there's been all this imagery all along? That's where we get communion from? Really, there's a bag which represents unity in the middle piece? Sinless, pierced, is broken? You know, I hope that all of these things would super encourage you. And then I also hope that you would love the Jewish people more. And again, because one of the greatest gifts we can give the Jewish world is to be Christians who in the name of Jesus love them, care for them, because we ultimately want them to come to know Jesus is their Messiah. And so I'm gonna leave us with just a a, a few verses because I never knew these and it's really helpful to have them pointed out. One thing we don't want is we don't want the Jewish people to be the great omission of the great commission. Now we all know the great commission, right? You're all getting ready to go to Germany and Romania, which is awesome, that God wants the world to be saved. But did you know that God actually gave Gentiles, us non-Jewish people, a specific role within that? I had no idea until someone slowed me down and personally helped me realize this. So I just want to share this with you. We could call this the Gentile Great Commission if you want. And that's this. In Romans 9 through 11, Paul shares God's heart for the Jewish people. And he says this. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. He still wants his own fellow brothers and sisters to be saved. Fellow Jewish brothers and sisters. Through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy salvation has come to the Gentiles. Wait, what, Paul? You're saying salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy? Why? Why would you say that? That's maybe a little weird. What does that mean? Paul's not making this up out of thin air. Paul is actually taking this from earlier in Deuteronomy where God is talking. God planned long ago in the Exodus story that I will make you jealous by those who are not a nation. I am gonna use a people group that's not you and they're gonna make you jealous. Jealous has that sort of negative connotation, but here it's like, wait, why do you have what I don't have? That's what it really means. And so if we could go to the next few verses here. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, that's the Jewish people, and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If their rejection of Jesus initially meant the reconciling of the world, all the world gets access to salvation, if that's what the rejection meant, how much more good will come when they receive him? That's the argument that Paul's making there. For as you were once disobedient, you and I, as, as you and I were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. In other words, if we go to the next slide, we needed them. God used them. He chose them. They preserved the Bible. The Messiah came through them. We needed them. And salvation came to us because of what God has historically done through the Jewish nation. But the Jewish people and the Jewish nation need us now to help them receive their Messiah back. Would you pray with me? And we'll give this time over to the Lord. Lord, thank you. Thank you again just for you being you. Thank you. You're you're loving, you're faithful, you're kind, you're almighty, you're powerful. And Lord, you have done wonderful things. Historically, Father, you have loved the Jewish people. You've chosen them. You've been faithful to them. You're still faithful to them. 
But Lord, uh, you want them to know your son. Would you help us be a part of that process? Would we be a part of what Paul talks about, this, this calling, this special calling to help your chosen people uh, realize the grace that comes through the suffering servant that was promised long ago. So Lord, we thank you that we are in this relationship with you. And Lord, would you use us, would you use this church to bless the people, the land, and the nation of Israel and the Jewish people living in Atlanta, living in Georgia, living all over the United States. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we just give you the rest of our morning. And we are grateful for you. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and that the Jewish nation would know you. In Jesus' name we all pray, amen.